Normal Show Live are their own and do not necessarily reflect the philosophy and policies of Normal. Listener discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think we need to rethink and recriminalize our marijuana laws. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws presents... Normal Show Live, Marijuana Nation. Now, here's your host, Normal's Outreach Coordinator, Radical Russ Belleville. Good day, tokers and toquettes, and welcome. It is Tuesday, March 13th, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Thanks for joining us. We are going to have ourselves a great show today. We've got a full studio, all sorts of people joining us, including sitting to my right, our co-host, Ganja John. How you doing, Ganja John? I'm doing good, Russ. How are you doing? Buddy? I am just making it, just uh, recovering from a long, long week, but uh, we'll talk more about that later. We've also got Wiz Coleco down there at the end. How you doing, Wiz Coleco? Good, man. How are you? Uh, doing doing really good, getting by. Also Thanks, here man. at the table, we have got uh, Todd Armstrong with Todd's Toker Topics later on today. Todd, how you doing? Not too bad. And yourself? I'm doing fantastic. What's your topic for today? Uh, rearing. Rearing. Bringing up children. Oh, that kind of rearing. Correct. I'm, I Avoid see. the puns, please. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pun-free zone here. All right. But also joining us from our virtual, or, or in our studio also, uh, Brian Blank is over here. I don't want to forget Brian Blank. How you doing, Brian? Hey, guys. All right. And uh, from our <laughs> virtual studio in blank. beautiful Grastoria, Oregon, our senior news editor, Cannabis Carrie, is waiting. How you doing, Carrie? Hi, guys. All right. Hola. Now, today we're going to kind of ad lib things a little bit because uh, Cannabis I Carrie. I just literally got here 10 minutes ago. Literally, <laughs> exactly. Literally <laughs> got there 10 minutes ago. Tell everyone what happened uh, on your uh, trip. Uh, no. No. It's no, okay. I was just kidding. <laughs> I, I had some car trouble. That's all I had to get. To, I had to work on my car for two days on vacation. I had to uh, put in a water pump and do some tires and change some belts and, what, you know, fun stuff like what that. What are we calling the car now? Susan Staranded? My friends and I don't because I don't know if you remember last year I took the same stupid Suzuki down there yeah. in a blue head gasket. So they are they have dubbed my car Susan Staranded <laughs> and asked me to please not bring it back. <laughs> they don't want it in Idaho. And I'll just quickly I'll tell you interestingly Idaho uh, Boise does not have a Suzuki dealership. Uh -huh. So I crawled all through a huge wrecking yard yesterday looking for a rim. They had one Suzuki in there. Oh my god! One. All right, so Carrie's got the day off from the news, but we'll check back <laughs> in uh, at sure. our at our hour two for some more talk. So I got the news for you today. Uh, breaking news: Angel Rach, uh, the uh, the Supreme Court uh, case. Angel Rach, that woman, uh, the brain cancer patient, the medical marijuana activist and freedom fighter, was kicked out of the hospital today. We'll tell you why. Also, we're going to take a look at Colorado, where the cost of the DUID bill may be dooming it. And they've got two more legalization initiatives to take a look at. And in New Hampshire, bills on medical marijuana and hemp farming to clue you in on. We've got Electric Tuesday today, a tune from Synaptic Soul that I'm going to bring to you. Ed McCann comes in at the bottom of the hour from Virginia Normal to rebut some reefer madness statements in Virginia. And me and Kevin Sabet at the end of the show. Back after this. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Hi, I'm Radical Russ. One of the best things about marijuana is the wonderful aroma. But when you travel a lot like I do, that aroma becomes a suspicious smell. That's why I endorse Stealth-Products.com, the leaders in smell-proof containers. From smell-proof vacuum bags to smell-proof backpacks and duffel bags, all the way to smell-proof digital safes, Stealth-Products.com has you covered. Stealth-Products.com brings you safe, secure, odorless layers of protection with activated carbon fiber. Backpacks and duffel bags are simple black so as not to attract attention with a logo or flashy design. Now, nothing is perfectly odor controlled from the detection of drug dogs, but with proper vigilance, containers from Stealth-Products.com will help you avoid nosy humans. You're now listening to Elliot Beats. Stealth-Products.com. Stealth-Products.com. 
Yo, what's up? This is Miles from Slightly Stupid. You're listening to Normal Show Live. Weedmaps.com. I'm Radical Russ from Normal. In my job as outreach coordinator, I travel every month. And when I'm on the road, I need a fast, accurate way to find the medical marijuana dispensaries in the area. So I turn to Weedmaps.com. Weedmaps.com has the best dispensary locator online or on your mobile device. Search by zip code or let Weedmaps find you, and in seconds you'll have the addresses, phone numbers, and customer service reviews for the medical marijuana dispensaries in the local area. Weedmaps.com also has a section devoted to helping you find a doctor who understands and recommends medical marijuana under your state's law. You can even check prices on the medical marijuana stock exchange. Coming soon, you'll even be able to find the listings of normal attorneys and chapters, local head shops and grow shops, and the best weed-friendly businesses. Weedmaps.com has the information you need to be an informed cannabis consumer. Visit Weedmaps.com today, a proud sponsor of the Normal Network. marijuana, industrial hemp, consumer cannabis. It's time for this week's Normal News with Cannabis Carry. Cannabis Carry has the day off from the news. I'm Radical Russ with your hemp headlines. Uh, this coming in from NBCBayArea.com. Cheryl Hurd reporting on MSNBC.com. Woman with brain tumor says she was kicked out of the hospital for using medical marijuana. From San Francisco, California, a medical marijuana celebrity with a brain condition said a local hospital kicked her out after she attempted to use medical marijuana inside. Angel Rach, who fought for the right to use medical cannabis in a case that went to the U.S. Supreme Court in 2004 and 2005, talked to us outside the UCSF Medical Center in San Francisco moments after she said they booted her out. Quote, the pharmacist says you're allowed to. You're not allowed to have cannabis in this hospital, Rach said. And if you're going to try to have cannabis in this hospital, we're going to we're going to call the feds. End quote. Rach said she checked into the hospital Monday morning for doctor ordered tests on her brain. She suffers from chronic pain and seizures from an inoperable brain tumor. And doctors didn't give her very long to live. Uh, The UCSF Medical Center has released the following statement. UCSF is a smoke free campus, and this includes medical marijuana. Several members of the media have asked if UCSF allows the use of a vaporized form of marijuana. It does not. Even a vaporized form of medical marijuana releases particles in the air that are damaging to the lung. Any particles from vapor and odor could have an impact on other patients and hospital employees. Under federal and state law, a physician is at legal risk related to any activity that could be construed as prescribing medical marijuana to a patient. End quote. Also of note in this interview from uh, Cheryl Hurd, she says, during our interview with Angel Rach, she appeared to have a seizure. When the fire department and paramedics arrived, Rach refused to return to UCSF. Instead, they took her to St. Mary's Hospital. You know, a story like this uh, just continues to underscore how medical marijuana patients are second class citizens. No matter what we do to try to pass a medical marijuana law, there's always going to be some way in which they are discriminated against. I can bet, even though this is a smoke-free campus, uh, they wouldn't be calling the feds if someone was uh, smoking a tobacco cigarette. No, they would just be uh, dealing with that nice and quietly. But they're going to make a big stink about it because it's medical marijuana, because they don't like that medicine. They don't like the people that are using it. This goes to show how far we still have to go. We're a major university in a major American city practicing medicine would do this to someone with a brain tumor, would not understand the the vital role that cannabis has played in Angel Rach's life, uh, such as it's been with all of these debilitating ailments. And and furthermore, to, to suppose that there's some sort of danger particle coming out of exhaled marijuana vapor is ludicrous to say the least. You are in more danger of the air that's floating around in a hospital than the air that's coming out of Angel Rach's lungs, uh, danger from staph infections and MRSA and the such. So don't give me that claptrap. All you're doing here is continuing the discrimination against a very sick woman who doesn't deserve this kind of treatment. Now we go off to the state of Colorado, where the DenverPost.com is reporting on two stories. First, we've been covering that five nanograms per milliliter per se 
THC in blood DUID law that they've been trying to pass in Colorado. It uh, failed last year uh, as activists rallied against it and showed how unscientific, unjust, and unnecessary it was. Well, according to uh, reporting by John Engel in the Denver Post, for a, the cost of the Colorado drug driving legislation will be a stumbling block. The SB 117, he quotes, carries with it some weighty baggage. The state public defender's office estimates the bill will cost the office nearly $600,000 more per year to defend drugged driving cases for the public defenders. Quote, the increased workload on my agency, the state public defender testified, will be significant and it will be costly. The uh, bill would make it effectively illegal to drive with any amount of a Schedule One controlled substance, such as heroin or LSD, in the driver's blood. It would also do the same for an amount of THC, the psychoactive chemical in marijuana, above 5 nanograms per milliliter of blood. And it would create a permissible inference of impairment, a boost to prosecutors, in cases where people are caught with any amount of a Schedule II controlled substance in their blood. Examples of Schedule II substances include cocaine and several prescription drugs. Now, of course, we've reported many times here at Normal about how unscientific this is, how people eliminate THC from their bloodstreams at vastly different rates. People have different uh, tolerances for uh, cannabis depending on how much they've used and how large they are. There is no correlation that can be drawn between a person's nanograms per milliliter and how impaired they are on a case-by-case -case basis. It just cannot be done. Uh, there were some interesting data here that were uh, turned up from Cynthia Burbach, the state's forensic toxicologist, who said the number of tests from drug drivers coming through the state's lab is increasing. In 2009, the state tested 8,625 samples for impaired drivers. In 2011, that had jumped uh, almost 2,000 to 10,393. Now, in the breakdown of these statistics, it's quite interesting. Uh, the 8,625 that were tested in 2009, 791 of them tested positive for THC, and 222 of them tested positive for more than 5 nanograms per milliliter. That's 222 out of 8,600. In 2011, out of the 10,393 samples total, 2,030 were positive for THC, and 5,000, or I'm sorry, 574 were positive for more than five nanograms per milliliter. We will continue to keep you posted on these per se DUID bills and fight them as best we can. In other news from the Denver Post, two more marijuana initiatives have been filed. Uh, the two new initiatives, one would legalize marijuana possession for any purpose, and one would expand the types of conditions for which a person can receive medical marijuana, add to a list of three initiatives already filed. One of those previously filed initiatives would legalize limited marijuana possession and has already qualified for the ballot. The other two are still seeking the needed language approvals or signatures. Of the newly filed initiatives, one, now known as Proposed Initiative Number 70, would make it a constitutional right to possess up to four ounces of marijuana for people 21 and older. The initiative would also allow for marijuana to be sold in stores that are regulated like tobacco businesses. The other initiative, proposed initiative number 65, would give doctors discretion to recommend marijuana for any medical condition. Currently, a doctor must diagnose a patient with one of eight medical conditions in order for the patient to qualify for medical marijuana. A valid doctor's recommendation is all that is needed under state law to be able to use medical marijuana legally. Well, once again, we've got one that's already on the ballot, one that's a very good initiative to regulate marijuana, and it's already gotten its signatures, and now it's time to campaign for that. Uh, I don't understand why we'd want to pour time and effort and money and signature gathering efforts and volunteer hours and everything else involved in a campaign to go with, what, now four other initiatives that have yet to qualify for the ballot. As it is, the four initiatives trying to get their signatures are all going to be competing with each other. They're going to be confusing the public and spoiling each other's ballots, as, as each other's signature petitions, by having duplicate signatures of people who can't remember which one they have uh, signed, which one they haven't signed. It's a really good thing that the Regulate Marijuana Like Alcohol has already made the ballot and is going to avoid any of that cannibalization of the uh, voter resources, of the signature resources, of, of the funding resources that are going to be out there. Now, that said, I can never be against anyone trying to legalize marijuana, so good luck to you, and I hope things turn out well. 
Moving on to the state of New Hampshire, medical marijuana is gaining steam there. According to the uh, Marijuana Policy Project, a hearing on New Hampshire's medical marijuana bill, SB 409, ran past 5 p.m. last Thursday evening. The Senate Health and Human Services Committee, chaired by Senator Jeb Bradley, a Republican of Wolfboro, listened to two and a half hours of testimony, nearly all of which was offered in support of the bill. The bill's prime sponsor, Senator Jim Forsyth, a Republican of Strafford, introduced the measure and made a strong case that support for the bill transcends partisan boundaries. He said, quote, I have never used marijuana in my life, but it's clear to me that marijuana does have legitimate medical uses. This bill is carefully designed to protect the rights of patients and doctors while minimizing the potential for the law to be abused. And I strongly encourage my colleagues in the Senate to support this sensible, compassionate reform. Uh, we will keep you posted on how the bill goes in New Hampshire. Now, it had previously uh, run into a veto from the governor there. Uh, the news now is that there may be enough support in both of these houses to be able to pass this with veto-proof majorities to override the governor should he stand in the way of compassion for sick people. More news from New Hampshire. Uh New Hampshire hemp farming is on the, the uh, legislature's docket here. The state house has passed a bill protecting industrial hemp. Uh, reporting here from the Huffington Post, Concord, New Hampshire, the New Hampshire house is giving the nod to hemp farmers after passing a bill to protect industrial hemp from being tagged as an illicit drug. The bill, which passed the house Wednesday without debate, would forbid industrial hemp, a botanical cousin to marijuana, from being t listed as a controlled substance. It would only go into effect after the Drug Enforcement Agency certifies that at least two other New England states have adopted such legislation. Supporters say hemp was once an important crop in the United States, but has not been grown in New Hampshire for decades. They say the plant has low levels of THC, a principal chemical in cannabis, that marijuana and can be used for other that has low levels of THC, the principal chemical in cannabis that is used in marijuana for a variety of illicit purposes. Well, uh, I'm glad to always to see a hemp farming bill be passed, but this part where they say it only goes into effect after the DEA certifies two other New England states have adopted the legislation. Well, the, the DEA is not going to cooperate in any way whatsoever. We have industrial hemp here in the state of Oregon. It is perfectly legal to grow hemp crops in the state of Oregon. All you need is the permission slip from the DEA that says it's okay to do so. And of course, the DEA is not giving out those permission slips. We have a situation where the Drug Enforcement Administration is banning something that is not a drug. All right, folks, and uh, other news here on the sports side of things. You know, we covered Normal Rock Sports on Friday with Herb Thrasher, and uh, he had suggested that we put together an NCAA tournament bracket, a uh, March Madness or Reefer March Madness, if you will. And I just want to encourage everyone to check that out. If you go to the blog at stash.normal.org, you'll find the Reefer March Madness 2012 <laughs> post, or you can just search for Reefer March Madness 2012. It's on CBS Sports, and they're hosting this uh, bracketology tournament with, you know, thousands and thousands of players nationwide. And I'm just curious to see how well the marijuana nation does against everyone else out there. You know, they say, how could you pick those guys? What the hell were you smoking? Well, we'll be able to tell them, and we'll be able to tell them why our brackets turned out so well. So if you want to get involved, go to the blog at stash.normal.org. Look for Reefer March Madness 2012, and uh, you can get involved with that, see how well your picks are going to turn out. Got one up there, John? Uh, I don't have one yet, but we will have one probably up today. I know Wiz Coleco got one. I filled one out last night. I yeah. got to say, mine is probably not likely to win, but <laughs> it was fun filling it out. So. Yeah, it's like I don't know a thing about college. I haven't seen a single game this year, so I have no idea. But I've seen a few games this year. It's really easy to fill out. It's a little push button. Click on which team you think is going to win. You can even do a like fill it in for yeah, you. Yeah, they have a fill it in a fill it in option. Yeah, so you, you can do that as well. It's just for fun. But again, we just want to see how well we do against all the other uh, players out there in the world. See how well the marijuana nation does. You can find it also. Uh, just go to cbssports.com. You'll have to create an account there with cbssports.com, and then when it comes time to log in, you're looking to use the password. Got to be 420, capital G, small O T, number two, capital B, number 420. Got to be 420 will get you in to Reefer March Madness. Does anybody have a women's bracket? 
<laughs> no women's brackets, no women's brackets. unfortunately. No, sorry. But uh, we are doing the men's one, so check it out during the break right now and go fill it out. See you in a minute. It's 20 after the hour, and we have to take a short break, if you know what I mean. Please support these sponsors who support Normal Show Live. Oh, have you ever met that funny repo man? A repo man. Have you ever met that funny repo man? A repo man. If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that repo man. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. Grow more Swing! <laughs> Yeah, I start, I start feeling tingly down there. Tween. What's up, guys? This is Miss High Times 2007, and you're chilling with us here at the Normal Podcast. Georgia. Hi, this is Willie Nelson, and I need your help. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 20s, and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stop arresting law-abiding citizens because they prefer marijuana over alcohol. Nearly 2,000 Americans are arrested every day on marijuana charges. We're unfairly destroying the lives and careers of hundreds of thousands of people each year simply because they smoke marijuana. These are not criminals, they're average citizens like you, good neighbors who work hard, raise families, pay taxes, and contribute to their communities. We need your help to end marijuana prohibition once and for all. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at norml.org. It's time for your daily Toker Tunes, the best in 420-friendly music from all genres that uplifts, entertains, and informs the public. Today we bring you tunes for Electric Tuesday, our segment featuring the best of modern electric music in the genres of dance, new age, house, and experimental. If you'd like to submit your song to be played on Normal Show Live, send it to us at stash at normal.org. Now here's some more great independent marijuana music for today's Daily Toker Tunes. All right, folks, welcome back. If you listen to our Daily Toker Tunes, you know every day we play music from a different genre. And on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays, we got music editors that handle that for us. We would love to have you as a music editor on a Monday or a Tuesday. It's Roots Monday with country, uh, jazz, folk, acoustic, uh, the, the Roots music. Or Electric Tuesday, which is the dance, disco, uh, house, electronica, dubstep kind of stuff. If you're interested in being a music editor and want to find out what it takes, just send me an email to stash at normal.org and uh, we'll get you on board if you want to uh, get involved with this. Our friend Cannabis Cure is uh, still involved with the uh, Normal Network. He's doing his video show now and spending a lot of time doing that. So I want to free him up to be able to keep producing those fantastic videos. So for today's Electric Tuesday, I'm going to bring you a song from the IOTA Promonet. Don't know much about the group, but they're called Synaptic Soul. And uh, the song is called Rolling Stone. And it's not exactly... A totally electronic song, kind of pop if you uh, ask me, but uh, I kind of like the sound of it. So here you go, Synaptic Soul with Rolling Stone. Examining damage, assessing worth 
Try to keep on me what makes me strong I'm running circles around and you're all sitting calm You're rooted firmly in the ground and I'm in that of long I'm running a damn marathon and you're all sitting calm You're so content that you're young And I'm an atom bomb Toward off an attack Eating square meals but craving a snack Ready to fly with all my bags packed Wanting to face it but not turning back Alternative Medical Choices offers healthcare the way it should be. Easy to access, patient-centered, team-based, and quality-focused. We offer a variety of natural, affordable healthcare treatment options like primary care, group acupuncture, massage, and assistance with OMP registration. As a patient, you will have a team of experts working with you to make you the best you can be. Call Alternative Medical Choices at 503-288-5579 or check us out on the web at altmedchoices.com. The effects of marijuana prohibition are felt by all Americans in every walk of life, regardless of race, creed, color, religion, social status, wealth, gender, sexual orientation, or even one's use or non-use of marijuana. As the marijuana smokers lobby, Normal hears the stories of these average Americans and brings them to the attention of our policymakers and our fellow citizens in this segment we call normal newsmakers all right welcome back everyone and uh, joining us here from virginia the executive director of virginia normal ed mccann how you doing ed i'm good how are you I- i'm doing fantastic and uh i, I really want to thank you for uh, all the great work you're doing with our state affiliate in virginia i want people to check out the website at virginianormal.org a lot of exciting things going on right now and uh, can you give us kind of a breakdown of what the uh, state of reform is in virginia what are you working on well, uh, earlier this year, uh, we had a couple bills come up in the General Assembly. Uh, our Assembly session every year is only two months long, or a month to two months, so it's very short. We don't have a lot of time to uh, lobby and, and get the bills going. But uh, in any case, one was actually a bill to study selling marijuana through our existing state-owned ABC stores, hmm. uh, which are the liquor stores. Um, and we testified on that, um, but it was killed, hmm. at which we expected. Okay. You know, what uh, What brought you to uh, my attention and why I wanted to bring you on the show today, uh, you guys sent out a press release, and I love seeing the press releases coming across from the uh, state affiliates, uh, a press release about yep. statements that have been made in the media by some uh, opponents of these marijuana reforms. And let me go to our video screen, because I got one of these ready to go. Uh, that was, You know, they were talking about, uh, and we've reported on this uh, story about Pat Robertson, 
uh, him coming out and saying the uh, the, uh, the that the marijuana laws should be changed. And and can you give us a right. setup as to this uh, person we're about to see? The uh, the uh, what's this guy's name? The uh, uh, the Commonwealth Attorney. Yes, the uh, prosecutor. There we go. The prosecutor. Right. He's saying as a district attorney or the uh, state prosecutor of okay. other states. Okay, let me go to that um, video here. We'll play that for our audience here, and then uh, we'll get your comments on it. Of uh, a controlled okay. substance. I mean, the whole thing is crazy. But according to Commonwealth's attorney Harvey Bryant, Pat Robertson needs to check his facts. I've been doing this a long time, and I know of no one who is in jail or in custody or has ever gone into custody for simple possession of marijuana alone. Brian said, okay, so there's the statement, you know, the old unicorn theory that uh, John Walters had uh, uh, prescribed a, a few years back that uh, nobody really goes to jail for possession. Your, your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, if you play the clip a few minutes longer, you'll see that he comes back and even goes so far to say as nobody nationwide goes, even goes into custody, and he can challenges us to find even 10 people who would so like to so. see a list of let's, names let's do that. who let's Pat Robertson that. and others are referring to as being locked in jail for marijuana possession alone. Because I don't think they're going to come up with a list that's bigger than this nationwide. In fact, I might be surprised if they can find 10. Brian also disagrees with Robertson's idea that marijuana be treated the same as alcohol. He worries it would become cheap and widely available to people under 18. Though Brian was part of the movement to lessen weed possession from a felony to a misdemeanor charge in Virginia. I don't disagree that possession of marijuana should be, as it is, uh, a misdemeanor. Brian says right, he does so that's, have that's a lot enough, of That's enough out of him. So, yeah, says he can only find less than 10 nationwide. That's, uh, that's some pretty bold comments there. And uh, tell folks about your press release and what you guys uh, said in response to that. Okay, well, uh, I thought I was astonished and shocked at what he would say. I mean, going so far as to say nationwide. Um, now, in Virginia, first-time offenders um, very usually will get just probation, but mm -hmm. once in a while they will get jail. And so I wanted to look into it, check the Virginia Beach jail website. It has the public information on inmates and their charges. And we found five current inmates mm -hmm. who are only charged with simple first-time marijuana possession. That was wow. their only charge. So you've already already found five. All right, let me go to another video here. And this one uh, is one of your uh, delegates, uh, and you know, like a representative, right, uh, in your legislature. And let's get his comments here on uh, marijuana. My colleagues, but up here on the dais, you've got two former, two current prosecutors and a former police officer. I would submit to the assembled folks in the room that the average length of stay of incarceration of someone convicted in Virginia of possession of marijuana first offense is statistically zero days across the when the cost of incarceration of folks for possession of marijuana is virtually nil because they're not going to jail, period. People getting caught for their first time after they've already gotten a pass on their first time, they're not going to jail. So I, I just don't appreciate trying to mislead us into thinking that 20,000 people are costing us $1,600 a pop uh, uh, all over the state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. And so that's uh, the uh, Virginia delegate Todd Gilbert who was speaking in that in those uh, legislative hearings. So, again, uh, Ed, what did you have to say to uh, Delegate Gilbert? Uh, well, unfortunately, we couldn't really respond to him at that hearing, which was last year, 2011. Um, but I have um, sent him this current press release. Um, we're going to follow up with him specifically. Um, our current press, you know, our current issues with the uh, prosecutor, um, Mr. Bryant. But um, I mean, you know, this is the, the standard excuse that these guys are using that block our legislation every year. That nobody goes to jail for this. And while it's true that most people do not get jail as a sentence for first-time possession, 20% uh, apparently do. 19 to 20% do. And in addition, folks are going to jail when they get arrested and waiting for, uh, you know, to get booked and whatnot. And so, and they also go to jail if they're violating the probation mm -hmm. by consuming cannabis. Absolutely. And so, you know, this notion that they don't go to jail is completely ludicrous and <laughs> shown by the evidence. Yes, we have seen the marijuana unicorns. They do exist. Uh, looking at the uh, normal website, normal.org slash laws slash VA for Virginia, we find that any amount, first offense, any amount of marijuana, a speck, a gram, any amount, 
Misdemeanor, right. 30 days, $500 fine. The subsequent offense, you get caught the second time. Misdemeanor, one year, $2,500 fine. Now, that's not what you're always going to get, but that's what you can get. Cultivation of right. any amount, any plant, any seedling, felony, five to 30 years, $10,000 fines. Sales of a half ounce or less, misdemeanors, half ounce or more, felony. Paraphernalia sale, misdemeanor. Paraphernalia sale to a minor, felony. I mean, these are real people that are impacted by these laws, and it just offends me every time I hear this talking point from the drug warriors that nobody really goes to jail. And I want to thank you so much for you know calling them out on it, Ed. Well, you know, I was actually, I, it was pointed out to me by a colleague who was looking at another bill that I, frankly, Virginia Normal had failed to really pay attention to that came up in our General Assembly this year, which was an expungement bill to expunge mm. first-time offenses. And the research that has been done for that bill indicated that there are 2,500 people in jail um, for first-time offense across Virginia. And this, this is, you know, our state public publishing this information. And, you know, for these public officials to come up and say this, you know, they say it with impunity right now, but that time has ended. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're going to hold their feet to the fire. We're speaking to Ed McCann, the executive director of Virginia Normal. And if you want to get involved, it's virginianormal.org. We're also looking to foster uh, regional chapters. Virginia is a big state. So let's get some, uh, some local chapters started in some of the other areas of Virginia. We'll coordinate with Ed and Virginia Normal and make this a statewide effort. And as you look statewide, Ed, uh, what, are, uh, what are some of your goals here? I mean, you don't have, I don't believe you have initiative petitioning, do you? Uh, we don't in Virginia. We don't have that ability. Mm-hmm. So all the laws have to be changed through the General Assembly. Um, we do have some 420 events coming up um, in the beach area and uh, in Roanoke and Richmond. Mm-hmm. Um, and then later on, we're hoping to have a good presence at our Floyd Fest, which is kind of our camping you know, music festival out west uh, in the mountains. And, um, you know, we're really ramping up our communication and outreach efforts right now while we have the momentum, while Pat Robertson is in the news and this sort of thing, and starting to hold our legislators, as you said, hold their feet to the fire. Yeah, and I imagine that that Pat Robertson, is, is he, he's not headquartered in Virginia, is he? He, he's in Virginia Beach. Oh, that's right. Okay, so he is headquartered in Virginia. So this is, I mean, this must be having some pretty serious ripples throughout the state. Even, you know, rural areas, I imagine, are, are, are getting this news. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Everyone's heard about the Pat Robertson thing, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what we're trying to do is make sure that they also hear about this Commonwealth attorney spouting off. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's the goal. Make sure that they know the Commonwealth attorney, the delegates there are are spouting off reefer madness. People do go to jail for marijuana. There's no need for it. Uh, get active with Virginia Normal. And let's find a way to stop this. So, uh, Ed, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for coming All on right, the show. And I uh, uh, encourage everyone to check out Virginia Normal to get involved. And uh, you're welcome back anytime. Let us know how things are going in Virginia. All right. Thanks, Russ. I appreciate it. All right. When we come back, we got Todd's Toker Topics. We're going to talk about rearing. <laughs> rearing. All right. <laughs> Stick around. Back after this. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. And now, another episode of Cannabis Shakespearean Theatre. I'm your host, Leonard Pinth Garnell III. Tonight we take a look at one of the finest works in the cannabis cinema, 1996's Half-Baked, starring David Chappelle, as interpreted by the Royal Shakespearean Cannabis Theatre Company. In this scene, Chappelle's character, Thurgood Marshall, has just admitted his addiction to cannabis to a room full of narcotics addicts. One addict, played in the film by Robert Saget, and interpreted here by the Royal Company's Sir Frederick Farrakh, takes umbrage at the suggestion. I find preposterous the notion that you, sir, may be addicted to cannabis. In times previous, I have undertaken lubricious endeavors, most revolting and unbecoming of a proper gentleman, in my servitude to the wicked powder of the coca leaf. Lo, that is an addiction whose chains would bind Hercules. At any point in history, could one identify a moment in your life so sullied by your ignominy as a cannabis slave? Methinks not. Boo this man! For Cannabis Shakespearean Theatre, I'm Leonard Pinth Garnell III. Here at Normal Show Live, we spend all week taking a look at the tragedy of American marijuana prohibition. But it's important to take a break and remember that we are a vibrant, diverse, and oftentimes hilarious community of people. 
So our friend, comedian Todd Armstrong, joins us to poke fun at one of Todd's toker topics. All right, we're back 40 after, and uh, Todd is cured from the laryngitis, I take it. Yes, yes, I've been doing more dr- deep breathing exercises and st- stretching said diaphragm. I'm so glad to hear it. So uh, Todd's toker topic today, rearing. Yes. Take it away, Todd. Funny word, I know I'll avoid the puns. Uh, uh, I think they were best uh, surmised in the great movie Knocked Out. Knocked Up, I'm sorry. But uh, I got to thinking about how what we call good parenting in this country after watching Kevin Smith's horror yet awesome movie Red State last night oh. about what defines good parents. And of course, Pat Robertson being in the news uh, today, of course, polarized how I define good parents. Uh, when I tell a lot of people that I did a podcast for a woman that work, works uh, for and with the moms for marijuana, they flinch instantly in a sense of the, the, oh my God, marijuana with children. But we don't associate with religion where we we, we give children a mindset to process things before they can really have a concept of what is right and wrong because it's instilled before they have a concept of that. Now, I, I noticed that a lot of people in America are defining good parents and good rearing as a list of don'ts. Like, don't let your child have sex. Don't let your children be around drugs. Don't let your child hear cuss words on TV, but secretly, hey, let's watch Family Guy. Don't worry about it. That, that's a funny joke over there whatnot. And when Pat Roberts says things like, we should change our marijuana laws. That's shocking to me. That's, that's an individual that's, that's, that's shoved in the face of the logic of the ridiculousness of prohibition to the point where he's literally segmenting himself from statements he said previous. <laughs> Not the ones about the world coming to an end in 2000 and 2001 and 2000, uh, the, the 13 times he predicted the apocalypse. <laughs> I'm talking about his, his viewpoint on what makes a good parent. Now, I was reared around pot and with pot. It's, that meant just mean I had a lot more camping trips as a kid. That just means I climbed more trees and I didn't cry when I fell out of them. It means that I cooked really creative foods with my parents for some reason. I don't know why we had such creative hamburger helper pantry meals, but I now know why. <laughs> I learned to garden. Not in a weird way, but Dad always wanted healthy tomato plants for some reason. I don't know if it was now a backdrop. I figured it was the screen now. <laughs> but on the other side of the family, I grew up with a very affluent, you know, pothead side of the Irish Catholic repressed where we're going to deal with our alcoholism through cannabis. Mm-hmm. And they completely do their, all their recreation stuff. I and mean, they constantly focus on what defined a good parent. And what defined a good parent is raising that child to, child to access the world. And when we have all this legalization talk where we're like, oh, well, we can't legalize, legalize it because the price is going to come down and it's going to have access to children. Good parents tell children what they should and shouldn't have by preparing them for the world. That's good rearing. And I know I rear children well, and I don't want anybody snickering at that because I don't have children of my own, but I have a nephew. And I give him the greatest pothead gift in the world, and I just got done doing it. I want everyone to go to my Facebook page. There's a picture of him with a dollar store cart. Every year on his birthday, he gets five seconds for every year of age he is to run around that store and go ape shit and grab whatever he wants. <laughs> it's a supermarket sweep slash Toys R Us shopping spree. He gets to do it every year. He got $66 in Just Silly String this year. And this is something that I could never thought up without pot. I was high <laughs> as giraffe ass when I thought of it. And I'm talking high as Jeffrey with a J's giraffe ass from Toys R Us. That's what I want to give to you. Pot gave that to me, and I gave that to my nephew. And that does not make me a bad person, but I want me to completely change the concept of what defines a good parent in this country. And a good parent provides a good future for their child, and we will not have a good future if we continue to waste our money on prohibition. I'm Todd Armstrong. I'll see you next Tuesday. Oh, yeah. Fantastic, Todd. That's awesome. We love it. Hey, uh, of course, we always want to know where you are performing, so let people know. Yes, I will be at the Cascade Pub in Vancouver, Washington tomorrow, but uh, most importantly, I'll be at Helium Comedy Club the first week of April, opening from Ben Bailey from Cash Cab. All right. Also, this just in, breaking news, it's Brian Blank's birthday, I hear. Is that right? No. No? No? No, No, this is when he had his brisk as a child. It celebrates his day. We're we're talking about how it looks like. Who told you that? Who who said that? Somebody told me that. I don't know. Someone's a fucking liar. When's your birthday? It's not even. It's June 13th. June 13th. Uh, Happy happy half birthday. Half birthday. All right, folks. I guess it's not Brian's birthday. So the hell with that. (laughs) We're going to take a break. When we come back, we will uh, bring you my uh, face-to-face with Dr. Kevin Sabet in in Houston, Texas. And uh, stay tuned. It's Normal Show Live. Hey, Tokers and Tokettes. This is Radical Russ from Normal Show Live. We're proud to be the voice of the marijuana nation and proud to have you on our team. Now, you can represent NSL in your own Normal Show Live gear from HandmadeApparel.biz. Adam Hand of Handmade Apparel is one of us and a huge supporter of our show. 
He's designed the classic blockhead line of NSL shirts, hoodies, hats, and more. Worn by Radical Russ, Cannabis Carry, and Ganja John on the show and at live events, the designs feature their iconic logos and the It's Got to Be 420 Somewhere in the World tagline. Proceeds directly benefit Normal Show Live and HandmadeApparel.biz, one of our community's strongest supporters. You can also get your Cannabis Cure UK, Ganja John Show, Irie Island Hour, and more gear from the Normal Network at HandmadeApparel.biz. Visit HandmadeApparel.biz today. You want answers? I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers. I want the truth. And you have offended Shaolin Temple. You can't handle the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Radical Brand. All right, we've solved the mystery. It is not Brian's birthday today. It's Sabrina Fendrick from Normal. Yes, Sabrina at the office, if you're listening, <laughs> happy birthday. I told, I told Russ earlier in the day, hey, mention that it's Sabrina's birthday. He didn't hear, hear the sub part and I, thought I yeah. was just making and fun I'm, of Brian's name. Or I'm something. horribly embarrassed uh, because I gave Brian 30 spankings that I had for Sabrina, and now I don't know about the <laughs> refund policy, but I'm really uncomfortable. Works. I'm uncomfortable. But happy birthday, Sabrina, <laughs> and uh, thank you for all the work you're doing with Normal Women's Alliance and, of course, at the National Office. We appreciate yes, it. Yes, we course. appreciate it very much. All Congratulations right. on your birth, Sabrina. You deserve it. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to move on to the video that I had stored up from my time at the Baker Institute. By the way, my uh, Baker Institute video now has 4,400 views. It's the second most viewed video ever at the Baker Institute. Ooh. I'm second only to Mideast Peace. So <laughs> yeah. there's that. And we know the one's two lost happen. causes, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ra- ra- Radical Russ and Mideast Peace. <laughs> so here it is uh, the time that me and Dr. Savet got to go face to face. Enjoy. <laughs> I'm excited to understand finally why I belong in a cage. Apparently it's clear. Uh, Let me address a few of these points. Um, It keeps coming back to the alcohol and tobacco, and the taxes don't cover what the costs of alcohol and tobacco are. And like I said, yeah, because alcohol and tobacco are toxic and addictive. Marijuana, there was a study that was done in Canada on what was the enforcement costs and what was the public health costs of one individual Canadian drug user. Uh, just on a per person, per year basis, what are the costs? When I looked at alcohol, the cost of enforcing alcohol laws in Canada is about 160 bucks, 165 dollars per person. The public health cost was about 155 bucks per person. So you're spending 165 to deal with 155 worth of problem. With tobacco, the public health cost was about 800 dollars per Canadian. Obviously, because you know lung cancer, all the terrible diseases and and you know health risks of, of tobacco. Enforcement cost was about zero. It was almost negligible because really tobacco enforcement not a whole lot to it, right? You know, card kids for ID, but it's not like you have tobacco DUI stings that you have to put together or you know the things you'd have to do for alcohol. When they looked at this, uh, and the Canadian study looked at this for cannabis. They found that the cost of enforcing the cannabis laws in Canada was $384 per cannabis user, and it was saving $20 in public health costs. $384 spent to save $20. And that's what we would see here in the United States as well. Tobacco is, or, I'm sorry, cannabis is not alcohol or tobacco. And it's disingenuous to continue saying, well, alcohol shows us or tobacco shows us when cannabis is a completely different thing. Let's look at it for what it is and not try to compare it to things that are far more toxic and addictive. Yeah, please do. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously, Marijuana, cannabis is not tobacco or alcohol. Well, neither is crack, by the way. Crack is co- alcohol is connected to crime in ways that crack is not, just so you know, right? We know that alcohol is related to violent crime in ways that PCP is not. So, yes, these drugs are very different, and they have relative different addictive potential, as, that, as the chart showed. Um, I think ca- marijuana, given its, it, the driving while intoxicated issues, given the other uh, intoxication issues that it does to the brain, the brain changes on the, on the adolescent developing brain, etc., is closer to alcohol, although they have very different effects. I mean, yeah, I, I'll, I'll grant you, marijuana makes you mellow, alcohol makes you uh, uh, a, bit, a bit high strung in a, way, in a sense, to put it mildly. Um, but a lot closer than tobacco and marijuana, which, again, tobacco 
You can build a bridge and have a tobacco cigarette dangling from your mouth. You can drive a car. It, there, there, it is very different. Now, it's also very different in that tobacco is more toxic to the lungs and does cause half a million uh, deaths a year, where, where marijuana doesn't. Marijuana does have lung damage, but, but it's different. So I acknowledge that they're different, but I look at those are the examples in society that we have to look at of legalized drugs. So when you look at those examples and you look at the costs and benefits, I, I think it's important to, to see that as a, as a lesson. When uh, we keep talking about alcohol, we point out people drink and drive, and there's lots of deaths from drinking and driving, and there's lots of harms from alcoholism and the violence and the abuse. And yet, we still trust adults to be able to handle drinking alcohol responsibly. You know, you mentioned the, uh, the alcohol commercials. A horrible commercials. job at trusting at, at that because alcohol causes all that harm. Again, and I think we don't, we're not talking about alcohol prohibition right now, but you look at it from a public health perspective, and I think the term cultural accident is very apropos. Um, so that's a cultural decision that we've made based on that, and maybe we'll make a cultural decision in marijuana at some time as well. But, but, but I think they do have very different cultures that we need to look at. Right, and part of the culture under marijuana is a culture of outlaws is a culture of people who are never given the message that there is responsible use. You get that, ad, that fine print at the end of the alcohol ad that says drink responsibly. There is no similar message for marijuana to explain to people how to be responsible about it. Now, we at Normal try to do that, say don't drive, you know, don't endanger others, no minors, set and setting, and so forth. But we can't begin to make that cultural change so long as marijuana is illegal. So I have a question then for you on that, if, if I can ask a question now, is, is that if we are looking at marijuana to be legal and you're saying you're going to have some age limits on it, given that those age limits do not work, barely work for alcohol, although we do know 21 is better than 18 in terms of drunk, drunk driving. We, we have analysis that looks at that. We saved a few thousand lives based on that, increasing that age. But... How do we think that we're going to keep marijuana away from kids? I'm not saying that kids can't get marijuana now, so don't go there on the availability thing. I get it. They can. Mm -hmm. But why do we think that legalization would then restrict it even more, given, given our experience with alcohol and tobacco today and young people getting it? That's a genuine question. Well, the threat of putting me in a cage for responsibly smoking a joint isn't stopping the kids from smoking the marijuana now. But there's far less users. Of marijuana than we alcohol, don't know tobacco. that because we haven't legalized marijuana. We don't know how much more use of marijuana there would be. But I'm saying right now, given that it's illegal, and I'm arguing for that, and you're arguing for a change in policy, with today's policies, mm -hmm. there are far less users oh, of yeah. marijuana than tobacco and alcohol. You don't agree? No, there are less users of, of marijuana than alcohol and tobacco, but I could also note that the legalization and the regulation and education surrounding alcohol and tobacco have taken 12th grade lifetime use of alcohol down from 92% in 1976 to somewhere around 74% today. Lifetime use of tobacco among the uh, uh, same 12th 12th grade cohort from 75% in 1976 to around 44% today to a point where there's less kids smoking tobacco than pot. Right. But, but, and I acknowledge that, that this year we did see that. And I think that's troubling. Um, but if you look at, again, if you look at alcohol as an example, we have far more kids using it. And so kids, do, that access translates to them using it. So I don't see how making it illegal is going to reduce kids using marijuana. Right. Making it illegal has not reduced kids from using marijuana. Making it legal at least provides the point where we have uh, regulated stores that are selling it. We have people that are checking IDs for it. We have people, uh, clerks that are stores that can be uh, given uh, 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 the stings. There was a recent thing, recent story I just covered in Inglewood, Colorado, where they did a, a alcohol sting using officers between the ages of 18 and 20 with IDs, with regular IDs, not fake IDs, with regular IDs. And they went to 28 of these different bars in uh, Inglewood, uh, Colorado, and they found that about 24% of the bars would serve these guys even after they showed their ID 18 to 20, right? But when they went to the dispensaries in Inglewood, they found you couldn't even get in the door without showing your medical marijuana recommendation and ID. Well, well, I still believe legalization and regulation c gives us far more but control. But you're assuming the black on. market is going to go away under legalization. I don't assume I'm the black market's going to okay, go away. Okay, so we're still going to have that. So we're still going to have people and dealers who don't check IDs and, and people who don't care about And they have to compete with that. a legal regulated market that they, they can't. That they will undercut easily they when we can't. tax it. 
because that's the number one argument is that we legalize it and tax it. Well, when, when you do that, because that's been the argument of state legislators, you will still have that black market. In Canada, when they added a $2 tax to cigarettes, they saw a black market emerge and they immediately had to repeal it. In New York City right now, the biggest underground d- uh, drug problem, one of the biggest, is not cocaine, crack, or meth, or any of that. It is tobacco because they increase the prices on tobacco. So you have from the south, the runners to the north, and that's a, been a huge underground issue. So this idea that that is going to go away under legalization when it is so uh, embedded and so endemic, I, I, don't, I don't see how that's going to happen. I, th- I think we agree there's always going to be a demand for drugs, and there's always going to be someone who supplies those drugs. And I've heard it said here in a previous, I think it was one of your slides, where you said, well, the Mexican drug trafficking organizations, these transnational criminals, it only accounts for 15 to 25 percent of their revenues. So why do we give criminals any business? Why do we want to fund them in any way? But we don't know. That, that's my point is, Russ, we don't know that those are going to go away under, under legalization, that that, that that 15 to 25 percent is even going to be denied, assuming even that's going to be denied. Best case scenario, 25 percent denied. Seventy five percent of their revenue still comes from the other drugs and it still comes from the other activities. But to think that they are just going to go away because you've legalized it and taxed it, they, they make such a profit margin. They will simply undercut that. Well, of course, they're not going to go away. Criminals are criminals. They do criminal things. That's that's why they're criminals. The question is, Mexico. how much business should we give them? How many opportunities and how many markets? When you're talking in the hundreds of billions do- of dollars, I'll, I'll tell you that you know they can take the cut. Okay, and, and so, let's cut them. Yeah, but but how do we know that we were even going to be able to do that? Is my question. Let's try it and find out. I, this is the thing that just it, it, it frustrates me to no end is this idea that that we have to subsidize these criminals to be able to run marijuana crimes or else if we don't, they're going to turn and do other more desperate violent crimes. Well, yeah, they're criminals. That's what they're going to do. But one thing they cannot do is manufacture drug demand out of whole cloth. People that smoke pot generally don't want to do meth. They generally don't want to do heroin. Those people able to get legal pot at a dispensary or whatever it might be that's regulated aren't going to turn there's a legal market today in california Uh, anybody with a pulse can get a car to legally obtain marijuana today in california i think we can acknowledge that okay i think everybody acknowledges it i mean your your boss alan st pierre on national tv said illegal uh, california has legalized marijuana okay so we know that so there's still a black market in california for marijuana i mean i I haven't i haven't seen it gone away so i'm even giving you the benefit of the doubt on the 25 percent but that's questionable but that that we're even going to be able to deny them that that black market is far far smaller than it was before before california had uh uh, prop 215 in medical marijuana you could sell a pound of marijuana wholesale for 2500 to three thousand dollars now that price is down to two to fifteen hundred dollars there's not as much money to be made at it by the people that are doing it illegally anymore. I, I, i look forward to seeing that data but again we're concerned when the price goes down that 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 consumption is going to increase and again i say i don't see that a priori that is necessarily something that is a bad thing i think it's a bad thing when people use marijuana and do bad things yes if they use if they abuse it but what we have here is a system that treats all use of marijuana as if it were abuse it says russ belville needs to be put in a cage because some kid might smoke a joint russ belville needs to be put in a cage because somebody but might Russ, drive stone. that's my point the real practical reality, you're not in a cage nobody's uh, but I could out. be at any moment. <laughs> I thought it was supposed to. You were supposed to mellow you out a little bit. Here's so, my hold on. Life. But the point is there are 100 million people who have tried marijuana, and most of them are not on occasion. If you look at the statistics of those who are, they, they haven't been incarcerated. And for those, those, those are deep racial issues, ma'am. Do you think that's going to go away if we legalize marijuana? Will the race issue go away, people? Of course not. There are, there are underlying issues that we need to deal with. All right, and well, it's, 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 it's a faulty assumption to think that they, that they would be dealt with that way. But... So we can agree to disagree. Harm to the user. Procedure. Well, you're bringing up both well that, that, that is a question I wanted to ask you, Kevin, because we've got a lot of stats up here. National Institutes of Drug Abuse say there's a 9% you know, lifetime dependence rate on marijuana. Am I an addict? No, it's not the National Institute on Drug Whatever Abuse. It is. Am I an addict? I, I, I have no idea. And so you're not, I'm not going to, you're not going to rope me into some like, you versus, Russ, I don't yeah, know. Do I think I, you're a great guy. So I don't know if you're an addict or not. And I, you know, frankly, like but I, I said, use marijuana God bless every you day. and I good luck. At least five to seven times every day. God, God bless you. I, I'm not, I'm concerned with, with the problematic marijuana use that is happening in society. But again, I'm the marijuana user who is using it more than almost any other marijuana user. Like I said, five to seven times a day, I smoke marijuana. I'm that user. I'm that heavy chronic user and again the the not your father's woodstock weed that always cracks me up when marinol is 100 percent thc I, I think i know i know i'm quoting the drug warriors even though we didn't get everything settled we <laughs> and and i think 
that I'm trying to imagine how lively you would be if you didn't smoke marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> I would be in trouble. <laughs> but uh, some would uh, say that's my medical use. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back. And uh, good time there with the debate with uh, Dr. Kevin Sabet. And uh, love watching your comments. You can call in in the next hour at uh, 971-533-7111 if you want to talk about it. We're hanging out with a full crew here in the studio. Going to be plenty to chat about, so stick around. Normal Show Live's Toker Talk Radio is up next. And for Ganja John, Wiz Calico, Cannabis Carry, Todd Armstrong, and Brian Blank, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, take care of each other, Tokers. Don't forget to log on to our Reefer March Madness. Reefer March Madness on the Stash blog at stash.normal.org. Let's have some fun. We love it. We love the earth. This is Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Take it on one more time. You take a seat, you manage, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seat, you manage, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. Take a seat, you're